Now, um, people who lived during the Great Depression, y'all, most of them don't call it the Great Depression. They call it hard times. And there aren't a whole lot of them left anymore. I mean, think about it. You would have had to be, let's say, 10 to remember the Depression. And maybe that meant maybe being born in 1920, 25. And so you're getting up there in age. So we don't have a lot of survivors left, but we have children of the Depression. Uh, my parents were lived during the Great Depression, and it changed them completely. Okay, they're very, very different people from people who don't have to go through that. Now, today, y'all, you know, we're living through some rough times, obviously, with COVID, right? A lot of people lost their jobs, their livelihoods, their businesses. But because of the Great Depression, y'all, we now have a lot of things in place that has made the suffering a lot less, okay? Nowadays, you have unemployment insurance. The government has stepped in and helped people, um, you know, paid them when they weren't working, helped bail out some businesses and things like that. That kind of stuff, y'all, would have never happened unless we'd had a Great Depression. Okay, that was just the bell to tell Mr. D to take attendance. You notice the dates here. There's a, some people kind of fudge on the dates a little bit from 29 to 1940. Um, but uh, for sure, by 1930, y'all, we have a depression going on. Now, you notice it ends in 1940. America gets into World War II in late 1941, really not until 1942. But what's happening, y'all, and this is a thing to remember, it is, it, you know, the New Deal programs of Franklin Roosevelt do not end the Great Depression. What they do is lessen future depressions, depressions and they lessen the suffering. What got us out of the Great Depression, almost everybody will tell you, was World War II. Now, we weren't in the war yet, as I said, but what we were doing, y'all, is we were making stuff for the British and later for the Russians. And we were rebuilding our military and getting ready just in case we had to go to war, y'all. So that was the big, big deal. Now, one of the greatest movies to come out during this time is this one. I'm going to let you just see a sample from it, okay? See if you recognize that. Okay, so Dorothy Gale from The Wizard of Oz, right? She's crash landed after being picked up by a cyclone in Kansas. Notice it's all kind of sepia or however you say that, that kind of black and whitish color. And then an amazing thing happens. She makes her way through her ruined house, which of course has landed on one of the wicked witches. Opens the door and check it out. It's now Technicolor. It's color, and that was very rare then. Now, as you guys will see when I talk about life in the 30s, for the most part, people wanted movies to escape, y'all. They didn't want to see movies that reminded them of their own depressing lives right during the time. And I've probably already told you guys a little bit of the story how the novel Wizard of Oz is related to, some people believe, the populist movement. Dorothy wears silver shoes in the book, right? Some people remember wanted silver to be coined with gold. They go to Oz. People wanted 16 ounces of silver to equal one ounce OZ of gold. And uh, she, of course, takes the yellow brick road or the golden road to uh, there. And there's all kinds of comparison, y'all, that you can make. And people have written entire giant essays on that. But anyway, I open with that. Because that's kind of how things were. The Great Depression was black and white in a lot of ways. It was very dreary. And then with the New Deal, it's like Dorothy opening that door. It gets beautiful and colorful, right? And things begin to get a little bit better. Now, the date you guys need to know is October 1929. Mr. D doesn't make you guys learn a lot of dates, although in this case, this is one you should know. What happens on that date? Whoa, that got big, okay? Okay. Well, the stock market crashes. What does that mean? Well, people were paying on average something, you know, the stocks were on average up to like 400 and I think it was 51 or something like that, y'all. But in a matter of days, they lose 60, 70% of their value. Now, how does that happen? Well, y'all, stocks are like basically um, 
stocks are, are sort of like baseball cards or magic cards or comic books. I don't know what you guys, if you guys collect stuff and trade stuff or not like Mr. D used to as a kid. But the thing is, you buy them at one price and over time, their value either goes up or their value goes down. And obviously, if you sell it for more than you bought it, you make a profit. And of course, if people want it, they'll pay more. And if it's in short supply, they'll even out, they'll like outbid each other. Like, I'll give you 50, I'll give you 55, I'll give you 60 and whatever. So stock values, y'all can go up, but they can also go down if people don't have a lot of faith in them. Okay, so stocks are sold on a market, an exchange where literally your stocks are combined with others. The guy or gal will sell them at prices. And if people won't buy them at that price, he is going to have to lower the price. Okay. Now, throughout the 1920s, during this great period of prosperity, the Roaring Twenties, we had what was called a bull market. Bull market, y'all, were when the prices went through the, through the roof. But what it actually was, y'all, was a bubble. People were bidding up. People were buying stock, y'all, just to buy stock. And they were artificially pushing the value of it up. I saw it with comic books as a kid. People would go crazy over a particular comic book. They would bid it sky high. And then people realized, you know, it's really a crappy comic book. We don't want it. And prices would come tumbling down. And some of us had paid a lot for some of those comic books thinking they'd be worth a lot. Yeah, Mr. D was a nerd. Can you tell? But anyway, you still are Mr. D, somebody just said. But anyway, um, and so that's essentially what's happening on the stock market, y'all. People are buying crazy. They're engaging in speculation, right? Pushing prices up way beyond what they should be. But then, and it's never been quite clear, people start selling and people start panicking. And you like are like, whoa, I bought this for 100. It's now 75 bucks. I better sell it while I can at least still get 75 bucks for that piece of stock. If I wait, it might be 50. It might be 25. And so people, y'all start selling like crazy. Now, this is going to ultimately leave the crash of the stock market is going to lead to the Great Depression. And we're going to see businesses fail all over the place. And I'll explain why that is. Now, here we see Variety, which is actually sort of a media a culture newspaper, y'all. One of the most famous headlines in history, Wall Street, remember where they trade the stocks, lays an egg. And that's not a good thing. So what we see, y'all, is panic, right? So here you see the Wall Street Stock Exchange. Now, it actually begins on what came to be known as Black Thursday. Stock prices plunged. Then stock prices kind of rallied a little bit on Friday when several rich guys got together and put a lot of money in and bid the prices back up. But then comes the weekend. People start thinking. Now, these guys, y'all, are trying like heck to sell the stock. You know, they're trying to sell it and get the highest price they can. Of course, if people don't buy your stock, what do you got to do? You got to lower it. Now, that's a stock ticker. And they're seeing what the latest prices are of that particular company's stock. Now, that's the floor of the stock exchange. And it was, y'all. It was crazy. Now, some of these stock speculators, y'all, they lost everything. Um, you know, they lost a fortune. And so it was so bad. How bad was it, Mr. D? Well, it was so bad that stockbrokers, y'all, a lot of them actually started going into buildings several floors up and jumping to their deaths, right? Jumping out of there, which leads to one of the first of the bad jokes Mr. D's going to tell you today. So a guy goes into a hotel, right, to get a room. And so the guy at the hotel says, hey, is the room for the night or is it just for jumping? Pretty good, huh? All right, there we go. Now, I'll talk later about the picture that I use for the back here, Migrant Mother. It's one of my all-time favorites. Here you guys see the notes, uh, basically what AP expects you guys to get. This is the big overall picture they want you guys to get about the Great Depression. The Great Depression is obviously the 1930s. Policymakers in, in Washington are going to respond to the 25% higher unemployment, y'all, to the craziness, the upheavals by changing our economy. Now, our country had been laissez-faire. Government stays out of business. We're going to see that change big time. And also, y'all, we're going to see people's expectations of government change. Nowadays, like as soon as this COVID stuff started happening, y'all, and people lost their jobs and businesses started failing, immediately, Republicans and Democrats started saying, look, we got to do something. 
that's relatively new, y'all. That came out of the Great Depression. During the Great Depression, what people did is, huh, this is kind of bad. Well, it'll get better. We've had depressions before, but they didn't call them depressions, y'all. They called them panics. And somebody came up with the idea, you know how people are always messing with the language. Well, panic sounds scary. Like, oh my God, it's a panic. It's a panic. Let's call it a depression. Doesn't sound as bad. Everybody will just chill. It's not a panic. It's a depression, man. And so what we really see, y'all, is the birth of modern day American liberalism, which will really go through the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, 80s, into the 90s, y'all, where we start expecting government to do certain things, to provide what we call a safety net. So if you do lose your job, you get hurt on your job, the government will help you at least temporarily. So it's what we call a limited welfare state. It's not as far as some countries go, y'all. There are some countries that promise what we call cradle to grave coverage. Literally from the moment you're born, the government's there to take care of you and the government's there to bury you, right? In some places, it's even more than that. From the moment you're conceived, to like the moment, whatever, they're taking care of you. America hasn't gone that far, at least yet, right? Okay, so obviously the causes of the Great Depression are important if you wanna see how we can prevent this kind of thing from happening. Now, you guys remember when we did the 20s that almost everybody did great during the 20s, except for the farmers. It was never good for the farmers. In fact, as soon as those soldiers returned to their homes in Europe, and as soon as those battlefields could be cleared, they started planting their crops. So what happens in 1919, 1920, farm prices plunged. Farmers were hosed, right? They borrowed money, they had bought land, and the depression is only gonna make things worse. Also income, y'all, was very, very unequally distributed, okay? Now I'm not saying it's perfect by any means today, but it, it is somewhat narrow. Now we do have your mega ridiculously ultra rich people, but you know, it's hopefully, better than it was. And we can see really here, y'all, in the 20s, it peaked, you know, where, um, you know, a small part of the population controlled most of the pop, uh, most of the money. But during the Great Depression, everybody nearly got poor, y'all. Almost everybody, rich and poor, was hurt. The only family I can think of, y'all, that wasn't really hurt were the Kennedy family. Now, John F. Kennedy's dad, Joseph Kennedy, he smelled a rat. He figured something was going on with the stock market. He pulled his money out when he could, y'all. And as a result, the Kennedys were rich. I mean, Rick James rich during the Great Depression. And of course, price wages drop, y'all. So John F. Kennedy said, well, the Great Depression wasn't that bad for our family. It wasn't that bad at all. We had lots of workers and it was very cheap, you know. Now, overproduction of consumer goods. Now, consumer goods, y'all, are like bottled water, hamburgers. You consume them and when they're done, they're done. And you're gonna have to buy another one next time you want to use it. But there's also, y'all, what we call consumer durables. Consumer durables are things like washing machines, cars, um, your computer. Now, you don't like use your washing machine once and then throw it away and buy a new one, right? You buy it and you're, you're kind of good for the next several years, you hope, right? Except for planned obsolescence, it always breaks right after your warranty expires. If you guys don't know that, you'll know it once you buy one someday. But the thing is, y'all, they're meant to last. So the thing is, in the 20s, y'all, everybody had bought their washers and dryers and their radios and stuff like that. But the companies kept making them like people were still going to, to be buying new ones. Well, they're like, how come people aren't buying our washers and dryers and our radios and stuff? Well, because they bought one last year, the previous year. Okay. And so companies realize, all right, let's stop making stuff. And if we stop making this kind of stuff, we don't need the workers, so we're going to lay off people. So a lot of people, y'all, got laid off for that reason. Also, y'all, there's a lot of consumer over overconfidence in the economy and buying goods on credit, buying goods on credit. Remember how in the 1920s, advertising really got going and people started buying stuff? Well, people had bought too much. And even the dumbest of us, Mr. D counted here, eventually gets to a point with your credit and goes, hmm, I've kind of maxed out my credit. I maybe better stop buying stuff and start paying it off. So you see a decrease in what we call aggregate demand. Overall, throughout the economy, y'all, people started buying less, okay? And you can imagine when you lose your job, or as we'll see, people lose their bank accounts, you're gonna buy even less, right? I mean, because, I mean, even the dumbest person, except for my friend, John, 
um, who got laid off and went and bought a 280Z car that day. I never understood that, but he did and later got repossessed because he didn't have a job to pay for it. But most people, y'all figure it out. I've lost my job. I'm not going to buy stuff. So if people aren't buying stuff, y'all, because they don't have jobs or they've lost their bank account, we don't need as many people to make stuff. And so people start getting laid off. Okay. Now, the other thing too, y'all, people had done what was called buying stock on margin. Okay. Now, I don't ever think this is a good idea, but I don't know anything about money. I mean, I'm awful about it. But to me, common sense says don't buy stock if you can't afford to lose everything that you buy in it because it could go down to zero if the company fails. But these people, y'all, let's say a person said, I've got a thousand dollars that I've saved for years and I want to invest in the stock market. So they go down to the bank and they or to the stockbroker and they say, look, I want to buy a thousand dollars worth of stock. And they're like, hey, tell you what, we'll loan you eight hundred and fifty dollars. OK, of that thousand dollars. So you're like, oh, really? Well, heck, I'll buy more stock then. OK, I'll buy a couple thousand, three or four thousand dollars worth. If all I have to do is put down, you know, one hundred and fifty dollars to get a thousand dollars worth of stock. Well, heck, I can. My thousand dollars will buy me eight thousand five hundred dollars worth of stock. Right. And I'll be, you know, I'll be on the on the uh, I'll be waiting to pay for it back now. But the thing is this, y'all. If the stock market keeps going up as it did during the great bull market of the 20s, think about it. I buy a thousand dollars worth of stock. I borrow, I don't know, several thousand dollars worth of stock, but the stock prices doubles and triples as it was doing during the time. If I ever get in a real problem where I got to pay them back, what do I do? I sell my stock and then I use the profits. Maybe I bought it for a hundred. I sold it for 500. I use that money to pay back the loan. But of course, that presupposes something that prices are going to keep going up. Now, the problem comes if prices start dropping. I paid one hundred dollars for that stock. Now it's worth seventy five. I got to sell it. I sell it. Now I still owe the person twenty five bucks if I bought it on credit. And so the bank shawl that had loaned this money, they really, really start struggling. They're like, oh, my gosh, we where's our money? Where's our money? You know, we loaned all this money out to people and they would start calling up their clients like, hey, I, this is a margin call. I need the money back that I loaned you. Well, how do I get that money? I sell my stock. How do I sell my stock? I'm going to have probably have to lower the price to get somebody to buy it because everybody and their mother is selling their stock right now. So it's going to help push the price further down. People, y'all, too, we're playing the speculation game. Now, Mr. D is a conservative investor, such as I have anything to invest. I invest in the long run. You know, this is the kind of investing Mr. D does. You just had a beautiful you know, daughter, Mr. D. Why don't you buy some stock? OK, great. I'll put a few thousand dollars into the stock. And when she turns 18, I'll sell it and boom, it'll pay for some of her college or something. Now, that kind of long term investment almost always works. But these people weren't doing long term investment, y'all. They were doing this. I'm buying it 100 today. By the end of the week, I expect it to be maybe 120, 125. I'll sell it. I'll take my profits. I'll take my principal. I'll buy some more stock and that will go up and so forth. And we had the same thing kind of happen. Y'all were just little, little kids. But in 2008, y'all, everybody and their mother was buying real estate, buying houses. And, you know, you'd buy a house. You'd live in it for five years. The price of the house would double. You would sell the house. You'd take the profit from the sale of the house and pay off your mortgage and you'd buy another house and you'd live there and it would double. And so people were doing this crazy thing out in California until, of course, the prices began to crash. And when that happened, people were hosed. They owed more money, y'all, than their house was worth. OK, and that was happening during this time as well, too. Now, what we also get happening, y'all, are a lot of bank failures and business failures. And I'm going to kind of try to explain how that happened because it's kind of a ripple effect or a multiplier effect. Now, this is the way banks work. And I'm sure most of you guys and gals know this, but just in case you don't, banks don't make money, y'all, from holding our money. When Mr. D takes his $1 million paycheck each week down to the bank, and I put it in there, um, they don't say, this is great, Mr. D. Thank you for your million dollars. We're going to leave it here untouched. And when you come back, it'll still be here protected by us. No, they take that million dollars and they loan out about, you know, $800,000, $900,000 of it because banks make money, y'all, 
by loaning out money. That's why they can afford to give me a lousy one or two percent for my money being in there because they're going to charge somebody else more who borrows that to build a house, to start a business or something. So banks make money by loaning money. OK, so what this means, y'all, is banks don't have much money on hand. You know, if everybody goes to a bank at one time and wants all their money out, the bank doesn't have it. It's only got 10 or 15 percent of the money actually there. Now, this is what's called a run on a bank or a bank run. If rumor gets out that a bank is struggling, people will show up at the bank and they'll say, I want my money back. Now, that still happens. I There was a bank in Friendswood my parents had money in back in the 80s, and there was a terrible, terrible crash all with our savings and loans in the 80s. And my parents didn't get there in time, and the bank failed, and their money was gone. But because we have something from the Great Depression called the FSLIC and the FDIC, you get up to probably 200 to half a million dollars of your money back, okay? They did not have this during the Great Depression, one of the many things we learned. So if a bank, if rumors, it doesn't have to be true, y'all, if rumors of this bank is struggling, it may go bankrupt, what do you do? You rush to the bank and you want your money, not 10%, not 50%, you want all of it. And so the trouble is, y'all, um, this these bank runs would sometimes be self-fulfilling prophecies. The bank would go bankrupt because everybody went there to get their money out. And if you were at the back of the line, forget it. And this was actually a racket that happened, y'all. People would find out there was a bank thing going and mothers would show up with their little babies. And think about it, y'all. You got a screaming kid. And if you're a decent person and there's a mother holding a baby and you're in line, what are you going to do? She's behind you. Okay, ma'am, go ahead in front of me. And then the next person, all right, ma'am, go ahead in front of me. And then she'd take her money out. And by the time it got to you, sorry, we're out of money. And I remember the story, y'all, and this man was a janitor. He'd worked for 40 years or so at a school. He'd saved up a few thousand dollars. He had it in the bank for someday he hoped to be able to retire. There was no pension. There was no Social Security. And he stood in line patiently. And when he got up there, they were like, sir, all the money's gone. And he had lost everything he'd saved. So he went home. He had a little apartment kind of thing in a basement. He threw his belt up over the the pipe up in there and he put it around his neck and he hanged himself. That's the kind of thing that happened, y'all. So that was a bank run. Now, I didn't put it in here, but uh, there's a movie during the holidays, during Christmas that a lot of Americans love to watch. It's one of my favorites. It's called It's a Wonderful Life. And this guy who's really depressed, y'all, decides to end it all. And when he does, an angel appears and says, hey, let's look and see what your, what your town would have been like you know, without you having been born. And so he finds out that the town would have been awful. All kinds of bad things would have happened if he hadn't lived his life. And so he changes his mind. But one of the things, y'all, that led him to this is a bank run. Once again, what's the name of the movie? It's a Wonderful Life. And it shows a bank run in that. Now, the next thing I think I ask on the note, y'all, is um, why did businesses fall? Okay, this is a weird multiplying effect. And let's look at something nearby that we can maybe imagine. All right, you guys know that NASA and the various other aerospace things connected to NASA are big, big employers uh, in the Clear Lake area, right? Everybody accepts that. All right, what if suddenly all of that were to go bankrupt? Well, those men and women that work at NASA, all right, they don't have their jobs anymore. If they have savings, they'll live off their savings. Maybe they can get something from the government for a while. But what they're not going to do, y'all, is go shopping, right? They're not going to go to the stores and, you know, get that Starbucks coffee in the morning or get that Pizza Hut on Friday night or, you know, go get that nice new dress or nice new pair of shoes. And so what happens is when, biz when, when one big business fails, y'all, other businesses that were supported by that business's workers, they begin to fail. And so when those workers, maybe at the Starbucks baristas or at the pizza place, they start losing their jobs, what do they do? They stop buying stuff, which means to even more. And normally, y'all, if a business has a rough patch, what they can do is they can call up their bank and say, hey, we're having a bad month here. Can we get a short term loan for the next couple of months? And the bank's like, no problem. We know the good times are going to come back. Well, guess what, y'all? The banks were shot. The banks were done. And so there was no money to loan out, y'all. 
So just make sure you understand a run on a bank is when people all come and demand their money and they bankrupt the bank. That can still happen, but at least you get your money back today. So it's not as likely. The classic movie, It's a Wonderful Life, shows a bank run and businesses failing. One big bank business fails. Other businesses uh, that depended on those that business, they lose it. And think about it. The contractors for NASA, people that make stuff for NASA, they're going to lose their jobs and so forth and so on, y'all. So it, it just builds up. There's a multiplier effect, you know. Uh, you may not think it, but, you know, hey, I, I sell shoes over there at Ren Wild on Bay Area. Well, all the NASA guys lost their jobs, so they're not going to be buying $150 running shoes. And so you might have to shut down your business. So that's the way it all worked, y'all. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's the best I can do. All right, so let's look at the man who was president when this catastrophe happened. And Mr. D thinks this is like the biggest tragedy ever for a president, okay? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. All right, so his name is Herbert Hoover. Isn't that alliterative? And this guy's story, he was an orphan at a very young age. He was poor, he was dirt poor. In fact, he couldn't even afford dirt, he was that poor. And so, um, but he lived with a family, friends or whatever, and eventually he made it, y'all. And he worked his way through Stanford University. He was part of the first graduated class at Stanford University. He became a mining engineer and he made a fortune and became a millionaire, right? Um, now, expectations were super high with this guy. Why? Because everything he'd done in his life, y'all, to this point had been not just a success, but a mega success. During World War I, he had helped feed Belgium when the people of Belgium were starving, probably saved millions of lives. I mean, what have you and I done today? Well, Hoover could say, well, I saved a few million lives, okay? Um, he also, Russia, had this awful, awful famine, y'all, during and after their civil war. Hoover got people to donate, got bit, uh, uh, others to donate, and as a result, he was able to save millions of people in Russia. And then when we had a terrible flood here in 1927 along the Mississippi River Valley, once again, by using voluntary effort, by leading it, this guy fixed it. So everything this guy touched, y'all, turned to gold. So when the depression initially happens, people are like, oh my gosh, we're so lucky to have this guy. If anybody can fix it, it'll be him. Well, the problem is y'all, it was too much for probably any one person to handle. And as you guys will see, his philosophy is gonna make it difficult. So he is gonna become the butt of like every bad joke during the time, okay? Now, you'll hear me say this a couple of times, but it's very important to put yourself in the mind of a lot of people then, but especially people like Herbert Hoover. They were very fearful, y'all. If you literally give money to people who aren't working, people are going to start expecting it. They're going to get dependent, okay? Uh, this is kind of crude, but this is how some people saw it. You go to the zoo. Or you go somewhere and you see alligators and you'll see a sign that says, don't feed the alligators. Well, why not? It's kind of cool to see an alligator eat something. Well, the trouble is, if the alligator gets dependent on people feeding it, it's going to maybe stop feeding it itself. And if you stop feeding it, the alligator is going to eat you, right? And this was sort of the fear. You get the people dependent on it, they're going to expect it. And if you ever stop feeding them, we're gonna have some real, real trouble. And this is a fear that a lot of people still have. You hear this echoed sometimes by some people talking about the COVID relief. You know, how long do we continue getting money to people? Uh, what if, as in some cases, people are making more money through COVID relief than they would have when say they're waiting tables? Well, why are they gonna go wait tables if they can sit at home and make more money, right? And some businesses are claiming that they're having a hard time finding workers because they, you know, people won't work for the old wages. And so what you may have to see y'all is businesses are gonna have to raise the wages and salaries much, much higher to try to attract people back. And what does that mean? When you and I go for that hamburger or that pizza, we're gonna be paying even more than we're paying it now. So this was a real fear that people had back then. Now, if you look here and you'll see the same picture later, this is what's called a Hooverville. Now, like we said, everything bad was named after Hoover. Um, and a Hooverville, y'all, was a people who'd lost their homes. You know, whether you were renting or owned it, you couldn't make the rent. You couldn't make the mortgage. 
Well, they're only going to put up with that so long. Now, you guys may have heard during COVID, we started trying to restrict foreclosures or evictions, right? We started saying, look, you can't, you can't knock some, somebody out. They lost their job. They lost their business. That wasn't the case during the Great Depression. You don't make your payments for your house. You don't make your payments for your, your, your rent for your apartment. Your butt and your furniture is out on the streets. And it was very common, y'all, for people to, to be out looking for work one day and to come back at the end of the day and find their stuff outside. And like, okay, we got to find a place to live. So what did some do? They got whatever they could, y'all, boards, cardboard, corrugated metal, and they made them something their family could live in. Okay, you and I wouldn't want to live in it. I hope none of you live in any place remotely as bad as a Hooverville. This is Seattle. I can tell because this looks like the Smith Building, and this is a public park, and this is where the people are living. Okay, now, to give you guys a break for me, I'm going to let you just see a little brief thing here from Disney about Hoover. <laughs> In Herbert Hoover's lifetime, he was known as one of the most competent and incompetent men on the planet. As a young man, Hoover was a famous mining engineer, organizing operations around the world. He was also an amazing philanthropist. President Wilson recruited him to organize food aid to Europe during World War I. Presidents Harding and Coolidge asked him to organize the economy as the Secretary of Commerce, and the economy boomed. He was the easy choice for president in 1928, especially after the popular Calvin Coolidge chose not to run for re-election. Which gets us to the negative stuff. Hoover was a different kind of Republican progressive. He thought social problems could be attacked scientifically, but he didn't want the federal government to do the attacking. The Great Depression put that philosophy to the test. As the economy collapsed in 1929, Hoover resisted a federal response. Instead, he tried to collect data and coordinate the efforts of states, charities, and companies to turn things around. When things kept getting worse, he eventually pushed for more government spending to boost the economy, but he refused to take any action that might be unconstitutional. Hoover was a brilliant organizer, but a terrible politician. It might not be fair, but he'll always be remembered for paralysis in the face of economic disaster. <laughs> So you get the idea from poor old President Hoover. And I do feel bad, y'all, because later on in his life, Democrats like John F. Kennedy will have him work on trying to end some poverty in, in America and listen to him that way. But when his moment came, he just wasn't able to do it. Now, everything that was bad was named after Hoover. Like, you think about it. Why do you call it a Hoover vacuum? Because it sucks. Get it? Okay. It's like a famous vacuum company. Now, a Hooverville, you've already seen that, right? It's a shanty town. You make it of tin, wood, cardboard, whatever you got. Here's that same one, that same picture in Seattle. Okay, a Hoover blanket. Man, you got to be bad to be using Hoover blankets because that's a newspaper. You can't even afford a blanket? No, but you can afford a newspaper. How about a Hoover flag? What the heck is that? It's not what you think. It's empty pockets. Why empty pockets? Because you ain't got any money. So your pockets are empty that way. And probably one of the most embarrassing things, remember all those people who bought Model T cars and stuff, and they're fairly like cars, y'all. Well, you couldn't afford maintenance. You couldn't afford gas. So what do you do? You attach a mule to your, <laughs> you attach a mule to your Model T and the Model T gets pulled by that. You make it into a horse and buggy, except it's a horse and, uh, you know, Model T. So it was just kind of sad, y'all. Now I'll tell you a little joke here. Now, to understand the joke, and it's always a bad joke if Mr. D has to explain it beforehand. But so back in the day, y'all, we used to have something called pay phones. Now, a pay phone was a place that you could put a nickel in. It was a nickel, five cents, and you could make a phone call locally. All right. And it was a nickel. I remember when they were 10 cents and they went to 25 cents. I think today, if they're still around the 50 cents. All right. So this is the joke. Hoover goes up to a person and says, hey, can I borrow a nickel? so I can call my friend. And the person looks at him and says, Mr. President, here's 10 cents. Here's a dime. Call all of your friends. Get it? He only had two friends, y'all. I mean, I don't think even his dog liked him at this point. It was just awfully, awfully bad for Hoover because people are going to come to realize, y'all, that he just can't handle this. Now, it's going to take a while. And 
I'm going to give him some credit and I'm going to say some things that he did. He did right, but maybe he did too little and he did too late. Okay. And there's supposedly a close up of a Hoover cart. I think there's the mule and you kind of see it connected to it. Okay. Now Hoover's initial actions. Now a very other important thing to see too, y'all. Now it's, you know, disasters have gotten politicized recently. You guys saw it with, um, when we had the when we had the freeze, right? Some people blamed green energy. Some people blamed deregulation. Some people people get politicized with disasters, and that probably was a man-made disaster. But if a hurricane comes in, are you gonna like throw your fist up and be angry at President Biden or angry at President Trump? Like you caused this, you caused this. No, you're gonna say, man, that's a disaster. Can you kind of help us out now? But back then, y'all, people believe, and there still is, you know, and I accept this, there is something called the business cycle. You're going to have good times. We call them booms. And you're going to have bad times. We call them depressions. Okay. And it's like a roller coaster. Hey, we're going up. It's great. Uh-oh, we're at the top. Whoa. Now we're heading down to the trough. But, you know, eventually it bottoms out. And what happens? You start going back up the hill again towards the boom. And so this had been America's history. Every 20 or 30 years, y'all, almost without fail, there was a panic, right? So when this happened, for a while, people chilled and they were like, okay, I know this is going to happen, but it's going to get better. Well, the trouble is, y'all, the years go by and it doesn't seem to get better. Now, Hoover had always depend on volunteerism, people donating their money and helping out for the famine relief in Russia or Belgium or whatever. So he asked for businesses not to cut wages. Now think about it, y'all, when you got people fighting for jobs, no longer do you have to try to bid to get workers. They'll take any job at any price. So what's natural for companies to do? We're just gonna cut wages because we know you guys will be fighting for the jobs. So he asked them not to cut wages. Businesses went ahead and cut wages, which means less money in people's hands to buy stuff. He also asked the unions not to go on strike. That means you're probably not getting paid if you're a union member. That means the union, um, that means the business you're striking against may fail. That means you won't have a job. Okay. And uh, they went on strike. And oh man, some of the strikes, I'm reading a book on the 30s right now, y'all. Some of the strikes were ugly and nasty. I mean, not just people yelling insults at each other, literally shooting and hitting each other. I mean, some of the some of the towns, like in Philadelphia, which is what this one's about, were awful. Charities, y'all, churches, Salvation Army, you you name it. They asked them to go further than ever. Get bigger donations. Give that to the poor. Uh, they asked the states to handle it because this thing didn't impact every place equally, y'all. Just like with COVID, some states are hurting more than others, right? And so, well, hey, maybe this state should handle it. But the thing is, y'all. What had worked in the past was not sufficient for the current disaster. And that's really going to kind of rock his world. So remember, I'm going to give you the same quote here that I mentioned before. Hoover did not want direct relief. Don't put money directly in the hands of people who aren't working because that's going to teach them a lesson. I don't have to work. The government will help me. And he did not want that. And he was a believer, y'all in what has become known as rugged individualism. Rugged individualism. Individuals should be tough. Remember, he was an orphan. You can't get, you know, it can't be much worse than that. Being an orphan, being super poor. But what had he done? He'd worked hard. He worked while he was in college. He learned, he started a company, and he became a millionaire. Now, doggone it, if he can be a poor orphan and become a millionaire, why can't people find a job? That was his attitude. All right, y'all, we were talking about Hoover's initial actions. I just want to kind of remind you of some of these things again. Um, remember, y'all, Hoover is a man that's kind of caught up in his own philosophy, and he's not really able to change or change fast enough. And so, but initially, y'all, he's like most Americans. Most Americans believe the Great Depression was just part of what we call the business cycle, where you have boom periods and you have troughs or bust periods, right? Boom, bust, boom, bust. So if it's bad, hey, you can know that at least it's going to be going back up pretty soon again. People believe that prosperity would come back again. And he used what had worked always in his life, and that was using voluntarism, right? That had worked in the Belgian 
uh, relief effort. It had worked in the Russian relief effort, the Mississippi flood, all of that stuff had worked. So he asked businesses to do some things. First of all, don't cut wages. Now, with prices plunging, with workers desperate for jobs, y'all, it was very, very easy for businesses to say, look, we got to cut because A, you know, we got to cut employees because we are not making as much stuff, but also we got to cut wages because, well, we can, right? Think about it. You know, people were desperate for jobs and you're not going to hold out for a high wage. You're like, hey, I will take anything. Right. And also he asked for unions not to strike because that's going to hurt the company. It means you're probably not going to get paid and it's going to slow down everything. And then also he asked for charities to up their efforts. Well, of course, charities, y'all need money from people who have money. And a lot of people had lost it. Um, think back when we had, I guess it was the freeze. Uh, and in the early days of COVID, where the food banks, y'all, were just running out and they were really asking people to, to step up and help out. Well, do that on steroids and you get an idea of the Great Depression. And remember, we've said this a lot of times, Hoover believed that direct relief to in individuals would destroy people's self-reliance. And as I was saying yesterday, this is a fear some people still have. You know, it's you got to be kind of careful. There's helping people out. And then there's enabling people to stay in that situation. And it's it's tough, right? And it's one of the things I think we're going to have to wrestle with as we try to make our way out of COVID, because we've had a lot of people, y'all, who've been at home, maybe not so much in Texas, but in some other states who've been at home now for, what, 14, 15 months and uh, getting paid in some cases for not working and some getting paid more than they were making when they were working. So. This is an issue that he brought up and people worry about. And as I think I ended yesterday by talking about um, the sort of concept of if you feed the alligators, and I hate to compare people to alligators, but think about it. If you feed alligators, they get used to being fed. And when you stop feeding the alligators, well, they might come looking for food and you just might be it. Okay. And so uh, these were real issues. Make sure you guys know the term rugged individualism. Uh, that's a term very much associated with Herbert Hoover, the idea being you can make it, right? You should be able to take care of yourself. Why do you need the government? And as you guys will hear me say in the video yesterday uh, that I recorded um, on the legacy, people were very proud, right? Especially men. People saw losing their job, y'all, as a personal failure. They didn't blame the president. They didn't blame the business cycle necessarily. They blamed themselves. What did I do wrong? OK, and it was psychologically damaging for a lot of these people. And Hoover believed, hey, you know, pull yourselves up by your own bootstrap. Look at me, man. I was an orphan and I went to Stanford University and worked my way through and I became a millionaire. If I can do that, you can at least find a job. Right. And so that was sort of the deal. OK, so that's kind of where we got to yesterday. Um, as I said, I kind of combined some stuff. And so you're going to find some things kind of repetitive, right? You're going to see a simple version and a more complex version. I really, especially with the time issue, I should have done more of that. Now, what you're going to see, y'all, that Hoover does, because he often doesn't get much credit for the Depression, understandably. But a lot of the stuff he tried to do, FDR is going to do, but he's going to do a lot more of it, right? Now, one of the things Hoover did was authorize a building of a dam that now bears his name. Now, Democrats don't like to call it Hoover Dam in some ways. They took the name back because they didn't want it to be associated with him. So some people call it Boulder Dam, right? But it's built on the Colorado River. And of course, it gave lots of jobs building the thing. Of course, it gave electricity to lost wages. And by the way, y'all, if you're ever out in Cal uh, not California, in Nevada, in lo at lost wages, I mean, Las Vegas, make sure you guys go to Hoover Dam because they give a tour there. And this is kind of how the tour goes. How do you like our dam tour? This is the best dam tour you'll ever see. Dam being D-A-M, right? This is a damn good tour, right? And so you're like, yeah, get. I'm, I'm tired of the damn jokes, okay? Um, and But anyway, they'll do that. And But it gives water to the west. You've got the beautiful Lake Mead behind it. It is awesome, y'all, if you haven't visited it. Now, the one thing to remember, and I'm going to talk about this more on another slide, is the RFC, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. This was a good enough program, y'all, that Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal actually kept this program and just um, you know, uh, ratcheted it up some. Now, it's going to give money to businesses that are failing. It's going to give money to banks. 
it's going to give money to states. Now, remember, the one thing Hoover won't do, though, is put money in people's hands. Now, the idea here is the trickle-down theory. Now, if you guys saw Biden's speech last night, he mentioned trickle-down, and he said it didn't work, right? Well, that's up for debate by different people. Democrats tend not to like it. Republicans tend to believe it works, okay? But the way it's supposed to work, as we said when we talked about the 1920s, the supply-side economics, trickle-down economics, is you're supposed to help out the people at the top, the big businesses, the banks, and all of that. And by them staying in business, by them doing better, the money, the benefits will trickle down to you and me. The trouble is that can take a little bit of time if it works. And But Hoover was not going to give money directly to people, remember. Now, the big mistake, and you guys are young, maybe you've made a mistake like this, but have you ever done something where when you do it, you know you're making a mistake, but you still do it? Well, if you haven't, there's still time. You guys are young. Hoover did that, and that was Smoot Hawley, or sometimes called Hawley Smoot, named after the two, the senator and the congressman who came up with this. Now, it kind of makes some sense when you think about it. We need to protect American jobs. Well, when we import stuff from other countries, that's made by people in those countries, not American. So let's put up high tariffs. Now, remember the Democrats under Wilson had lowered the tariffs, the Underwood tariff, and then under Coolidge, all we had raised tariffs up again. Well, this takes them up to almost 50%. Now, that's maybe great for Americans, but if I'm some American buying stuff from another country, they're going to raise the price of it. And what if my job, y'all, is based on selling stuff to other countries? What if I make stuff that is sold to other countries? What if I load that stuff on a boat that takes it to another country? Well, guess what, y'all? They ain't going to buy our stuff because if you raise my, your tariffs on my stuff, I'm going to raise my tariffs on your stuff. And so you start seeing this retaliation and it even has y'all international implications as far as World War II and really hurting the economies of Germany, France, Britain, Italy, um, in some ways being an economic reason for World War II. But more about that later. So if you guys haven't seen a movie yet called Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you need to, right? I probably should show it after the AP test uh, just for fun. All kids should see it if you haven't. So I'm going to show you a scene from it. This is a classroom. Now, of course, the kids in the class are supposed to be y'all's age. They look more like they're 30, but here you go. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the, anyone, anyone, the tariff bill, the Hawley-Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? The Laffer Curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point. This is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? Anyone? Something DOO economics. Voodoo economics. Okay, so there you go. Ironically, he is actually an economist and a comedian. His dad was the economist for President Nixon. Okay, that's Ben Stein. Um, now, anyway, y'all, so he says it's to raise money, uh, but it's also there, y'all, to protect American jobs. Now, the next thing to talk about, y'all, is just awful. That's all I can call it. Uh, my dad was 10 at the time, and my dad never forgot it. I mean, he wasn't there or anything, but just the callousness of this kind of thing. Now, if you guys remember, after World War I, Congress, a grateful Congress, had decided we're going to give between $500 and $1,000 to our vets because they did such a great job. But we're not going to give it to them now. We're going to wait until 1945, 25 years in the future when maybe they're getting older. Well, a lot of vets, y'all, began to start thinking and saying, hmm, you know, I don't have a job right now. Uh, I'm losing my house. Maybe you guys could hook us up with the money right now 
instead of waiting another uh, 13 years, it being 1932. And so to demonstrate their support for this idea, a lot of them started coming by the railroads. The railroad companies, y'all, let them ride the rails for free. And by the thousands, y'all, the former vets showed up and they basically surrounded the Capitol building. Now, this isn't January 6th, right? Something you guys just saw a few months ago. This is 1932. Now, a similar thing can happen back in the day uh, with what was called Coxey's Army. Now, Coxey's Army was a bunch of farmers who went to Washington, D.C. and wanted President Cleveland to help them because they were really struggling. And Cleveland basically told them, though it's the duty of the people to support the president and the government, it's not the duty of the president to support the people. And they went home and it kind of ended, but Coxey's Army was kind of a preview for what became known as the Bonus Expedition uh, Force, the BEF, or the Bonus Army, or the Bonus Marchers. You'll hear it under different names. So they surrounded it, and uh, Congress basically said, no, we don't have the money right now to pay you guys. And they weren't happy, and a lot of them, though, just went home. Others, y'all, chose to stay, and it got kind of ugly. Now, I know, um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen, like, sort of some of these homeless areas. We Fortunately, in Houston, we don't have as many, but if you go to places like Los Angeles, San Francisco, it can be, you know, they can be quite large and stuff, and and I hate to say it, but kind of scary. I mean, you feel for the people in there, but uh, and so these guys built a big Hooverville, a big shanty town right there in the middle of Washington D.C., y'all, right by the Capitol, right by the White House. Now it got kind of unsanitary, got kind of awful, and so they sent the police in, y'all, to clear them out. Well, it got ugly, and a couple policemen got hit. A um, couple of the bonus marchers, the old veterans, y'all, I say old, they're like in their 30s, uh, got uh, killed. And so President uh, Hoover asked his his general, his highest ranked general, General MacArthur, the famous General MacArthur, who would be famous in World War II for winning the war in the Pacific and uh, for, you know, doing so well at first in the Korean War. Um, he sends him in. And these poor guys, y'all. Um, they saw the tanks coming, they saw the cavalry coming, and at first, some of them thought, oh, look, they're having a parade to honor us. No, they were coming to clear them out. They used tear gas, they used bayonets in a few cases, and uh, ironically, one of, the, one of the colonels behind it, Colonel Patton, later to become famous, um, he ended up chasing out the guy who had saved his life during World War I, y'all. And uh, I remember my dad, when I would bring up General MacArthur or something, talking to me, he goes, he's the guy that drove the vets out of Washington, D.C. And then what's worse, Shaw, is after they chase them out, and they chase them all the way across the Potomac River, they burn their things. Some of these people, y'all, that's all they have left. And so it goes and looks really, really badly. Okay, there you see the tanks coming in, y'all. These are old 1917 American tanks. You know, some of these guys had fought alongside tanks like these. And now those tanks are being used against them. I mean, this was awful. Today we would say the optics look really bad. And the optics look really bad. <laughs> now here you see the bonus marchers in front of the Capitol. In 1932, Washington was under siege. The Capitol was surrounded by over 10,000 unemployed veterans of World War I from all over the country. Their only assets were the bonus certificates they'd been given after the war, which promised a cash bonus sometime in the future. They needed it now. Okay, so you'll see some of them speaking. Now, I'm going to let you see back here what happens. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. They systematically went down the line, burned up all the tents and all the possessions of the people there. I was thinking of Herbert Hoover when this happened, because his election was in three months. Yeah, it was right before the election, y'all. You know. I thought this would be, uh, would be the finish of Hoover. And it was. The orders of the president must be obeyed. And the roaring flames sound the death knell to the fantastic bonus army. In the shadow of the beautiful dome. Look at that, y'all. There's our captain. Of the United States of America. All right, so there you go.
are right next here. So here you go into the more detailed AP stuff, y'all. Now, by the time Hoover realized what he wanted to do would not be enough, he'd already lost the confidence of the people. Remember all the bad stuff named after Hoover? It was too little. It was too late. But there were some things he did try to do and you should be aware of because, like I said, some of them kind of anticipate what Roosevelt's going to do under the New Deal. He created a federal farm board. The idea was this, y'all, was to deal with farm prices, which were still continuing to go down. They had gone down after World War I, as we talked about. Now they're going down even more, okay? So the idea would be the government would buy the excess, uh, the surplus, right? And we, we do this today, y'all. This is going to be one of the things Roosevelt does, but calls it the Agricultural Adjustment Administration or agency. But we buy the excess crop, y'all. Maybe we give some to the poor. We give some to other poor countries or something. And you try to bail out some of the farm organizations. But once again, we're not putting money directly in the hands of the farmers. And there you see the farm board, y'all. Now, this is the one that I mentioned and I starred for you guys. If you mention anything about what Hoover did, probably the most important and most successful, if you want to say anything was successful, was the RFC. The head of the RFC, as far as I know, if I remember right, was Jesse Jones, who was actually a Texan, right? So kind of a, one of the first times a Texan gets really big in politics. It has $2 billion. And that's when $2 billion, y'all, meant something, you know? Uh, a trillion is the, is, or what is it? A billion is the new trillion, or, or a billion is the new trillion now, y'all. But anyway, it gave money to the state and local governments. Now, this is going to be kind of what Reagan and Nixon try to do. Uh, it's, uh, they called it new federalism, where basically we take the money in from all the people, but then we distribute it to you guys. Now, we figure the state, we figure the cities know better what to do. Rather than us say, here's some money for this, we give it to you and say, you know what to spend it on, you know your people. But it made loans to banks, y'all, made loans to the railroads. It, it helped out mortgage associations and businesses. And as I said, the benefits are supposed to trickle down. But, you know, a lot of people didn't have time to wait for that happen. Uh, some problems with it, it did work at first, it did slow down some business failures, but it wasn't nearly enough money. And also, too, there was a bureaucracy, there was a lot of red tape, and there were accusations, y'all, that Hoover and the people in charge of it were helping their political friends, right, and helping the rich and not helping the poor. So it wasn't necessarily popular with the people. But, of course, here's that trickle-down idea again. You help the rich, you help the important businesses like the railroads and the banks, and those will save the jobs, okay? And so if you guys are getting this, of course, don't give money to people. And as you guys will see, when we look at Roosevelt, it's going to be do this, yes, but also give money directly to the people because they need it right now. Roosevelt keeps the RFC and he expands it. Now, internationally, we've mentioned Smoot Hawley already. I'm just going to leave this up here. But I do give you a little bit more information, right? Uh, a thousand economists, y'all had told Hoover this was a bad idea. He went ahead and did it. And Hoover was a smart, smart man, y'all. But he's sort of like, well, I got to do something, man. So he does it. And it raised tariffs all the way to a third to 50%. So think about it. If I'm trying to bring something to the United States and it's 100 bucks, I'm going to have to pay almost 150 bucks to get it in there. And I'm going to put past that extra cost on to people. It's supposed to protect businesses. It's supposed to protect jobs, maybe bring some money into the economy so that they then could pay for things like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. But instead, y'all, countries around the world retaliated. If you're going to put tariffs on our stuff, we're going to put tariffs on your stuff. And you can see the large drop, y'all, not just in our gross domestic product here in red, but in our trade. Trade dropped precipitously. Ooh, that's a fancy word all the way down to here. And it's only when in 1932 or so, we start seeing trade go back up again. So that meant a lot of people lost their jobs. Now, the next thing here, y'all, is something that I usually talk about with World War II, or sometimes I talk about with the 20s. Now, after World War I, or we have the Versailles Treaty, right? And in the Versailles Treaty, if you remember it, the French and the British insisted 
on making the Germans pay reparations. Think about that word, reparations, to repair. The French, the British said, you Germans will pay for every bullet, every broken window, every single thing. And it, it amounted to many, many billions of dollars. Well, Germany was hurting already. There was no way Germany could pay. But there's another part to it as well. Now, once we got into World War I, we kind of excused, uh, we, didn't, um, we didn't then charge the British or French for the loans. But y'all remember, we had loaned the British and French money uh, and you know, weapons and stuff for three years before we got in the war. Well, they kind of thought, well, hey, when the war, when we joined, we were gonna forgive those debts. No, America said, look, you paid, you, know, you have to pay those debts. And so it becomes y'all really kind of a vicious cycle because it works kind of like this. It's like a revolving thing. America would loan money to Germany because Germany didn't have the money. Germany then would use that money to pay the French and to pay the British the war reparations. Then the British and French would use their war reparations to pay Americans back. And then we would use that money, y'all, then to loan it back to Germany. I mean, it was just kind of silly, right? But that's how it worked. Well, Hoover realizes, look, this just can't keep working right now. And so he asked basically the French and the British to stop collecting the debts. And we forgave some of our debts. The only country, by the way, y'all, that paid off all those World War I debts was Finland. Little Finland, new country after World War I, paid us back every dime. A lot of countries never did, y'all. Um, and uh, But this is going to lead to some real problems because if they can't pay back their debts, this is going to lead to some big loan defaults where basically some of the companies, some of the businesses just said, look, we can't pay it back. And so you lose that money that you expected to come in and you start seeing banks fail, not just in the United States, y'all, but banks failing overseas. And so what starts out as a depression in America, y'all, is kind of exported and starts impacting Europe. And I mean, you see things, uh, this had already happened a little bit before because of that, but you start seeing these massive, massive hyperinflation German people are struggling, and so they start supporting this dude called Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party, right? Um, and so this has some really important ramifications, y'all, and a lot of it comes from this one little smooth holly thing. Now, farm holidays. Now, farmers, y'all, you know, they were they they knew some basic economics here, and they start saying, "Look, we got to do something to stop what's going on. Our, we're losing our farms." and somebody can't pay their mortgage, the bank comes and repos their farms or they evict them from their house. So what farmers would do, y'all, they would show some solidarity. They would go to an auction like this and basically they would agree amongst themselves. Like, look, Farmer Smith's farm is up for auction. Don't any of us buy it or if we buy it, let's let's have like, a, like for $100. Let's buy it for $100. Nobody outbid the guy that bids for 100. And then they would all chip in hundred dollars, pay for the farm, and then what would they do? They give it back to that farmer. That was sort of their way to, to do it, or even to resist and not cooperate with evictions. Now, another thing they did, and this is so ironic, y'all. Now, today, you know, we talk about people being hungry in America and that, and, and I get it, but during the Depression, y'all, we had true starvation. People not just worrying about dinner, I mean, people have worried about dinner for days and people were really, really struggling. And at the same time, we have people worrying and not eating. We have our farmers, y'all, stopping crops, stopping cattle going to market, even shooting their cattle, spilling the milk and burning their crops. Now, why would they do such a thing? Well, they actually, it was more expensive to transport their animals, to transport their crops, than they could even get for those animals. It was cheaper just to buy a bullet and to shoot a cow, right? And of course, they're also thinking economically, they're thinking fewer cows, less meat, that means decreasing the supply, which means raising the price of it. And so while people are starving in the cities, farmers are shooting their animals, destroying crops and stuff. And eventually, this is why President Roosevelt is going to have an Agricultural Adjustment Act, which is going to try to control this and, 
and make it work by doing some of the same thing, y'all, plowing crops under, buying up surpluses and stuff. Now, here's a picture from the time farmer's holiday, right? And it's meant to suggest this picture, y'all, which would have been very known to the people at the time. This is called the spirit of 76. And in a way, y'all, the farmers are portraying themselves as what? The new revolutionaries, right? The new fighters, okay? That what they're doing isn't unpatriotic, it's patriotic. Now, I like this picture, y'all. Uh, this shows you that even during the Depression, people had a sense of humor. Now, look at these poor little kids. And my dad would have been about, maybe he would have been a couple of years older than these kids, okay, during this time. Hoover's Poor Farm, tobacco fund. So, in other words, if you pass by, you got a few cents, drop it in here for their kids. But look at their little sign here. Hard times are still hoovering over us. Instead of hovering, pretty clever, huh? Okay, they can make puns just as bad as Mr. D. Nobody makes puns as bad as Mr. D. Okay, now I've already talked about the bonus marchers here, y'all, right? Here's a little bit more detail. They promised to pay in 1945. There you see them all gathered on the steps of the, the Capitol, okay? Their Hoover bill they build, you see it there, made of tents made of cardboard, whatever they could have. Congress says we can't pass this bill because we just don't have the money. It's a budget buster. And even y'all, when FDR gets in power, they still don't give these guys the bonus. You know, they're nicer to them, but they're like, hey dudes, we just don't have the dinero. And when the police came in trying to move the men out, and there were women and children there too, y'all, Hoover decides to get General MacArthur, shown right here with the fancy job poor pants i always like those pants those look kind of interesting he orders them to go in now the sad thing was this y'all all hoover wanted was them removed but what macarthur does is he destroys them like they're the enemy he goes in with the tanks he goes in with the cavalry he drives them all the way across the river and then he burns their stuff to the ground and a lot of these people y'all that's all they had there you see the tanks there you see the cavalry going after America. So imagine y'all the irony, we're using our current soldiers to go after some of our previous soldiers and people never, never forgave Hoover for this. Now Hoover could have blamed MacArthur and said he exceeded his instructions, but Hoover y'all, he took the blame. And of course it, it, like many things, it added to his defeat. And this is the last nail in his coffin, okay? Now look at this picture here, okay, you see um, this was a flag that was flying over it, y'all, and during the fight it got torn, it got scorched a little bit, and there you see it. I mean, very symbolic picture, right, of what was happening. Um, so now we're going to listen to a song. I've given you guys the lyrics. You can look at the lyrics, um, watch the video, because there are some classic, classic scenes uh, from the Great Depression. Now, Hoover, y'all, knew psychologically he needed something um, to try to make the country feel better. So he asked the man who would later write somewhere over the rainbow for Wizard of Oz to write a Cheer Me Up song. Well, the song he got instead was Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? And it's really about these great American workers, these great American soldiers who had done so much. And now, y'all, they were lowered to the point that they're going around asking people, hey, brother, can you spare a dime? And so we're going to go ahead and let you listen to it here. Okay, we'll let you listen to it. Why won't it play? All right. Okay, let's try that again. Just waiting for 
here's the chorus. One flag of the railroad, I made it run, made it race against time. One flag of the railroad, now it's done. There, there's my Brother, grandmother, one of the pictures. And you spare it up. Once I built a tower. Oh, and that was built during the Depression. Up to the sun. The entire state building. Brick and rivet and lime. Once I, I built it. a tower. Now it's done. Brother, can you spare it on? Once in khaki suit. Gee, we look swell. Our soldiers are so hard on the doodly Half a million boots went slogging through hell. And I was the kid with the drum. Say, don't you remember? They called me out. Called me out. It was out all the time. Why don't you remember? I'm your pal. Say, buddy, can you spare a dime? And it goes on, and you can read the lyrics to the rest of it, y'all. Now, that was probably the most famous song of the Great Depression, and one that you guys could mention if you're talking about it. Now, let's talk about the Dust Bowl, and this was, I think, on your mock star test. Um, what ended up happening, y'all, is there had been a lot of bad farming practices. They cut down the trees. They had plowed the land, which takes the grass, which holds the sand, holds the dirt and everything together. And then they got some bad luck. Well, they even used cattle, y'all, that would just eat up the grass and pull up the roots. So the thing is, y'all, the soil had nothing to hold it down. But as long as it was kind of moist, it could hold down. Well, then there came a drought, you know, lack of rain. And this whole area here, particularly this area right here, began to start blowing away. Now, it wasn't just like little blowing away. We had massive storms, y'all, of dirt. People in Colorado woke up one morning to find um, pink snow. It was Oklahoma's red dirt mixed with snow that had fallen. People working on the Empire State Building began to get hit by dirt blowing all the way, y'all, from Oklahoma. Okay? Now, you can see, just look at that. That is dirt coming, y'all. And what would happen is, uh, it would cause so much static electricity that your crops, your crops would just literally desiccate. They would just completely dry all up and there would be nothing left for you to have or to sell. This is a very, very famous picture. I mean, just look at this. The guy's head's down. He's making his way through the wind and the dirt. Here you see a little kid. He's got his face covered. People died, y'all, of dust pneumonia. It was a real thing. You had to wear a mask to cover your face from it. No joke, kids got lost on the way to school. My dad told me stories because he lived through some of this of cars that would drive into the dust storm and when they would come out, the paint had been ripped off of them. That's how powerful it was. He also talked about dirt got into everything, y'all. Um, you know how if you go down to the beach, maybe you're gonna have some hot dogs or hamburgers and it seems like there's always some sand in the bread or something. He said there was sand or dirt in everything. They would get oily rags and stick them in the windows. They'd stick them underneath there. But somehow, y'all, even when you just washed your clothes, they still felt dirty. It was just constant. There you see stuff, you know, covered y'all. I mean, it was like a desert. We had taken a very, very fertile area and made a giant American desert. Now, so what do you do? Well, some people stayed, like my parents' families stayed. Others got the heck out of there. Now, when they would move, y'all, they would go to California. That was the dream place. I'm going to go to California. Um, I'll, I'll start over there. And in California, y'all, they treated them as badly as we treat any immigrants. I mean, they called them Okies, and Okies were like to be despised. The worst thing you could do if you were a girl was to bring home an Okie boyfriend. And it took a generation or more, y'all, for Okies to actually be treated and respected better. But they made their way there. And you'd load up the truck, and we called these refugees, because that's what they were, environmental refugees, fleeing uh, Oklahoma or wherever. Regardless of where they were from, y'all, we called them Okies. And it was just a really sad thing. Will Rogers said we were the first country, y'all, to go to the poorhouse in an automobile, right? 
And there you see them. Everything they owned, y'all, was on that truck. They were, you know. Now here's a the far edge um, of the Great Plains, a documentary of that came a new out beginning, years ago. This is and the last clip. place in America where a family could claim a homestead and build a future. We had the best crop that we had had in 1929, and everything was looking up. A sea of grass, once the domain of Indians and buffalo, disappeared beneath the blade of a plow. I saw the whole country transformed in sunset glow. All the brown prairie turned to gold. But then it was as if the land rejected them. The rains stopped and the winds came. We saw this cloud coming in, black, black dirt. And I'll never forget my grandmother. She said, you kids run and get together. The end of the world's coming. It came like a black wall, a tide of destruction that crashed over the broken plains, choking the life out of everything in its path. Somehow you never really escaped the dust. It always found its way in. And that's, I think, what drove people crazy. Some would pull up stakes and move on, but most stayed, always looking to the promise that next year would be better. We were just too selfish and we were trying to make money, and it didn't work out. Ken Burns tells the story of a generation that was buried and what it took to dig out. The Dust Bowl starts Sunday, November 18th at 8, 7. Okay, there you go. But a book, you guys, if you hopefully we'll have you read someday. I know in English class we used to make students read it. I don't think we do anymore. But this is the most famous description of the Dust Bowl, okay? John Steinbeck wrote this novel. He lived in California, worked out of California, and he researched and did a lot of this. And it tells the story, y'all, and they made a movie out of it. I'll show you a clip of it called uh, The Grapes of Wrath, but it was about the Joad family. Now, they were Okies. They lost their farm, and so they travel on Route 66 across the country. And uh, I'm doing a virtual run, by the way, y'all, where I'm running from Chicago, and I keep up track with the miles. Right now, I'm right here. I got to get here by December, by the way. But anyway, so they make their way there. Where is the movie? Tom Jones is played by Henry Fonda. Mark Jones is played by Jane Barwell. Casey is played by John Carradine. Grandpa is played by Charlie Gracefield. Rover Sharon is played by Doris Bowden. Bob Job is played by Russell Simpson. Okay, and there's a famous scene at the end, y'all, and I'll end with this. How am I going to know? There's Tom Joad. Well, maybe it's... He's getting ready to leave the farm says, in Oklahoma. So he got in California. Soul, soul, just little piece of a big soul. The one big soul that belongs to everybody. Then... Then what, Tom? Then it don't matter. I'll be all around in the dark. Yeah. I'll be everywhere, wherever you can look. Wherever there's a fight so hungry people can eat, I'll be there. Wherever there's a cop beating up a guy, I'll be there. I'll be in the way guys yell when they're mad. I'll be in the way kids laugh when they're hungry and they know supper's ready. And when the people are eating the stuff they raise, living in the houses they build, I'll be there too. All righty, y'all. Have a good day. I don't understand it, though. Me neither, Mom. But it's just something I've been thinking about. All righty. Have a good one. All right, y'all. So we're going to try to get through this uh, part one today and i'll take you guys through that and if i get if i have the energy left and mr d's running on empty uh i will try to get you guys into the new deal i was hoping you know i want to make sure we get that covered and get that done out of the way so we can next week we can concentrate on uh some other stuff to get you guys as ready as we can get you ready with the circumstances this year all right y'all so 1932 the election hoover's running for re-election um and uh, it's at the worst part of the depression and of course he's just had this bonus marcher thing 
The Republicans nominate Hoover. You know, who but Hoover, right? Sounds kind of like his name. And uh, they really didn't have a whole lot of choice, y'all. You don't tend to dump a incumbent uh, president, okay? Democrats, though, picked this governor by the name of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, he had run for vice president back in 1920. And as you guys will see, a lot had changed with Roosevelt. He'd had a heart, uh, not a heart attack, he'd had a um, polio, uh, mellitus, and things had changed quite a bit. And uh, anyway, he doesn't offer a lot of specifics. He's just sort of running as, hey, I'm not Hoover, right? And uh, kind of like um, what uh, Hillary tried to run against Trump in 2016. She didn't offer real specifics like, hey, I'm not Trump, right? And that's not really a very good strategy. People want to know what you're going to do, okay? Basically, all he promised was to end prohibition, and he promised, unlike Hoover, to get money to people directly, to put money in the unemployed people's hands. And you see him calling for a new deal, right? And, of course, this picks up on his cousin. That's right. They were cousins, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who had offered the square deal to workers. And then, of course, following that will be uh, Truman offering a fair deal. So I guess if you're a Democrat, your plan should be called a deal. But as you'll see, a couple didn't do that. Now, his song that he's going to use is probably the second most famous song in the Great Depression. And it was from a musical called Chasing Rainbows. And I'll let you hear a little bit of the song here. So perfect song for the time, much better than brother. Can you spare a dime in the sense of making people happy? All right. So the results of the election, FDR kicks, you know what? Even socialists didn't vote for socialists this time. They voted for FDR. FDR wins big majorities in both houses uh, and in Congress. And uh, so FDR should be able to get everything he wants. And jokingly and sadly, Hoover becomes known as the... President reject. Get it? You said president elect. President reject. Yeah, those people liked it. And here you see the results of that election. Blue, obviously, Democrat, right? Red, Republican. You know, he managed to win a few states up here in New England, um, but that was about it. And then it was just a tide, y'all, for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. By the way, he had a vice president by the name of John Nance Garner from Texas, by the way. If you've been to Garner Park, they'll have him on there for a couple of terms. And you can see 57 to 47 votes. Uh, I mean, uh, the uh, percentage of the popular vote, y'all, in the Electoral College, he won, what, 89% of the Electoral College. Unbelievable. All right. So Hoover, though, y'all, you have to remember, in those days, we didn't yet have the 20th Amendment. In those days, y'all, when you uh, got elected out of office or you got elected into office, there was four months between the election and the inauguration. Now, the 20th Amendment, which happens during Roosevelt's second term, moves it up to, uh, to January 20th, right, is how it works. Now, Hoover was what we call a lame duck. Now, a lame duck is a president who's either leaving because his time is up or a president who has been voted out of office. And, you know, a lame duck, y'all, is not very, very powerful. Now, Hoover still wanted to keep trying to do stuff. FDR, y'all, instead went on a cruise down to Latin America and completely stayed out of there. So the question is why? Well, as you'll see, he did not want his name tied to FDR. And to be honest, he probably didn't even know yet what he was going to do. But just to show you, y'all, how history could have been changed. An Italian immigrant, okay, went down to Miami where FDR uh, was visiting, okay, and riding with FDR in the car was the mayor of Chicago, Anton Shermack. Now, this Italian immigrant stepped out with a pistol. He fired, and he ended up not hitting, um, I think, a woman, actually, um, kind of knocked him a little bit out of the way. He ended up hitting the mayor of Chicago and killing him 
instead of FDR. So imagine y'all, history would have been very, very different. Now later the Italian immigrant, you know, he was executed for having done this. Um, they asked him, you know, why did you want to shoot the guy who wasn't even president yet? If you're going to shoot somebody, they said, why didn't you shoot Hoover? And he's like, well, because it's too cold in Washington, D.C., and I have stomach problems, and Miami is nice. The temperature's nice. So, yeah, it was crazy, y'all. So why did, as I said, uh, Hoover uh, and FDR not work together? He didn't want to be tied to Hoover's policies. He wanted to be known for his own actions. And finally, also, y'all, you know, being tied to Hoover might mean uh, lost popularity. And, of course, in a lot of ways, y'all, FDR didn't know what he was going to do. Now, one of the quotes I will share with you, it's a, we used to have it up on my wall, y'all, at my old school, was uh, that basically, you know, FDR believed you tried something. But if it failed, you admitted it, frankly, and you tried something else. But above all, you try stuff. So FDR, y'all, was, was just going to try all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Sorry about that, y'all. There's your lame duck, I guess. And so there it is, the philosophy. I knew I had it on here somewhere. Try something. If it fails, admit it and try something else. But above else, try something. Okay, I forgot to have the end quotes there. But that was sort of FDR's philosophy, y'all, was to try something. People wanted somebody to try. Remember, Hoover was still kind of captured by his rugged individualist philosophy. All right, so let's look at Franklin Roosevelt here, y'all. Um, he is the longest serving president, serving over 12 years, 12 years and what, three months he served. And you can't even do that anymore because of Franklin Roosevelt. We now have the 22nd Amendment that limits that. Of course, his initials, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR. And he becomes the first president, you know, to be known by initials, later JFK, LBJ, and then RMD. Uh, I'm not going to tell you who that is, but that's in the future, okay, um, in like 2028. But I'm not going to go for that. Anyway, now he had had polio as an adult, and this really, really changed him. Um, the man became a lot more patient. He became a lot less arrogant, y'all. People that knew the old FDR said he was one of these rich people that always kind of looked down at you, kind of, you know, thought he was better than everybody. In other words, a jerk. But when he got polio, you talked about laying somebody low, literally. He got it while swimming up in Maine. Uh, in the water, he started losing his ability to use his legs, and eventually, all below the waist, he was handicapped and could not walk. Now, as he worked on things, y'all, he he got better at simulating a walk. Um, his 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 two sons could help him, and uh, he could by swinging his legs, y'all, by swinging his waist with their help, he could almost look like he was walking. Now. This is one of only two pictures that I know of, y'all, that shows FDR in a wheelchair. Um, and, you know, today you'd be very proud, obviously, to have accomplished so much uh, while being, quote, you know, differentially able, right? But um, in those days, people believed it would make him look weak, especially with world leaders. So people knew he'd had polio, that he was somewhat handicapped. But they did not know the extent of it, y'all. The media covered this up when, you know, he might be taken off an airplane. They had to, like, carry him out on a stretcher. And they got him ready for a speech, y'all. They had a ramp. They would, you know, roll him up there, get him fixed. And he was very careful, y'all, on this lecture and on the speaking stand that he had. He would have, he would always keep one hand holding things. So he was free to use one hand, and then he would switch to the other hand. But... I mean, it was it was rough. And of course, polio is really going to speed up uh, his ultimate demise. And when he dies in April 1945, he is just sort of a shell of what he had been. So he defeats Hoover in 32. He promises a new deal, right, to help in the Depression. Now. All right, folks, so I'm going to let you hear one of the fireside chats. This was on the occasion of the bank holiday when for quite a few weeks, FDR shut down all banks in the United States until they could prove their solvency, that they were worth keeping open. But I'll talk about that a little bit later. My friends, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking. 
to talk with the comparatively few who understand the mechanics of banking, but more particularly with the overwhelming majority of you who use banks for the making of deposits and the drawing of checks. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days and why it was done and what the next steps are going to be. I recognize that the many proclamations from state capitals and from Washington, the legislation, the treasury regulations and so forth, couched for the most part in banking and legal terms, ought to be explained for the benefit of the average. So then he sat through y'all and as Will Rogers, the great comedian said, He's, he uh, he explained banking well enough that even a banker could understand it, right? And uh, so anyway, fireside chats. It's on your star. Good to know for AP as well, too. These are the speeches that FDR gave to try to encourage people. 